Hey all, this is Jeff Abramson and I'm a disembodied voice right now, but it's great to see so many people already here. We'll get started shortly. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff Abramson. I'm a senior fellow at the Arms Control Association and also manage the Forum on the Arms Trade, which is a network of approximately 150 experts and emerging experts around the world who work on arms trade, security systems, and weapons use issues. Delighted to welcome you all virtually to this first uh, session of the 2023 annual conference, as well as a great set of panelists. I'm going to quickly give a little frame for this and also share a little bit about our panelists and tell you a little bit more about how the technology is going to work. And I'm really glad you're here. Um, when I was envisioning having this discussion, I was really thinking about the war in Ukraine and what we're seeing. And I had my own sort of thesis about this. And in the conversation when we were prepping for this call, I think the panelists really challenged me on pieces of that. So I think we're in for a really good conversation. But as a big picture, obviously, this awful war in Ukraine is leading to a, a real load of weaponry heading into that conflict, especially from the West to Ukraine. And we are seeing. Um, uh, you know, an effort to ramp up production as well. And I have this concern that we may see uh, a great effort to sell weapons even outside the region because of the war there. I was a little bit worried about some restraint being lifted to within countries within <coughs> Europe. And I think Peter Bissman might challenge that a little bit. I also, we're gonna turn to talk about the Middle East. And I think those of us in the United States certainly were aware of when President Biden went to Saudi Arabia, uh, when he was planning to make Saudi Arabia a pariah, uh, really around oil, and that was, I think, an impact of the war. But as, as Sarah Leah and Nancy and I were talking about this, there are trends in the Middle East that Ukraine has a relationship to that could be making them better or worse or hard to tell what's going to happen next. But obviously, it's not the only story in the region. And then we'll turn to Michael Clare, who's going to uh, help us frame what this war is really meaning in the in a slight of a, a larger picture between the conflict now between sort of the United States and China, this this rising competition and, and where does this fit in? So uh, before I, they get started, I just want to tell you who we have. So Peter Vesteman is a senior researcher at CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, where he's been for many years. Uh, they have, uh, as you all know, every year they launch an update on annual arms trade trends. They are finishing that up. You'll have to wait for a month to get those results. So Peter's not going to spoil those, but he's going to provide a, some great insights in terms of what's happening with Europe. Um, Sarah Leah Whitson is the executive director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, an organization uh, founded by Jamal Khashoggi. She has a, a, a long experience in working in the Middle East, including previously heading Human Rights Watch Middle East and North Africa Division, which was active in 19 countries. Nancy O'Kyle will is the CEO and, and director, president of uh, the Center for International Policy, which also is the home for the Security Assistance Monitor. She has been working on Middle East issues for quite a long time as well. Um, she worked for a long time for the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Nancy, um, Tahrir Institute for Middle East uh, Policy, but also uh, many of you may know that she was once working in Egypt and was falsely uh, accused of misbehavior. And Michael Clare, who is a colleague of mine at the Arms Control Association and a visiting fellow there, um, has been working on these issues for many, many years. For more than 30 years, he was a professor at the five college professors of peace and world security studies at Amherst, uh, Mount Holyoke, Hampshire, Smith Colleges, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, he's done a lot of writing uh, on so many different issues. So I'm really glad they can join it. So I might start with Peter and ask uh, if you could turn on your video. And the question I have for you is at a big picture, 
Um, what do you see? What do you see are, is what's happening sort of with Europe and the arms trade in terms of you know relation to Ukraine as well. And I've asked all the panelists to keep the four minutes, so it'll be this will be try to be pretty quick here. Thanks, Peter. Yes, thanks, Jeff, um, uh, and thanks for having me here. Um, and yes, the effects of uh, the war in Ukraine on international arms trade are, of course, manifold. They include the accelerated and expanded demand for arms in Europe. They include most likely a strong effect on the global supply recipient relationships where arms transfers most likely are going to play an even more important role in the uh, global great power competition. Um, but of course, it also, as you said, means that Ukraine has received an enormous amount of weapons in 2022. An enormous amount of weapons compared to what it has received before, when it received almost nothing. Also, because supply states were very restrictive, they didn't want to risk that armed supplies would contribute to an escalation of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, but uh, uh, in 2022, also an enormous amount compared to what many other arms importing states are acquire acquiring. And, and most likely Ukraine will for 2022 in the CIPRI figures be somewhere in the same region as major countries, major arms importing states such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, India, uh, South Korea, or may, maybe even more than some of those. Um, now, what you already mentioned here is that, that there are some concerns about whether or not this is a change in the restraint that some European states have shown in the past uh, in arms exports to, con to uh, states in conflict or to regions where there are very significant ten tensions that can escalate into major armed conflict. And the answer to that is, of course, well, I think we'd have to nuance that picture of what restraint in arms exports in Europe was before. We could already see in the past, and there are plenty of examples here, and I only give a few, that a country like France supplied a, a whole uh, a large number of combat air aircraft and related cruise missiles, et cetera, et cetera, to India, which of course is a concern considering the very tense relations that country had in particular with its nuclear rival, Pakistan. Um, and those weapons were in volume more much more than what France has uh, supplied to Ukraine in 2022. Similar questions can be asked about uh, how the UK has been arming Saudi Arabia for many years, including in recent years, when those weapons have been used in the war in Yemen, a war which of course has been heavily criticized for a whole range of reasons. But we do see some restraint among some states. For example, Germany was a country that then decided to no longer allow weapon supplies to Saudi Arabia because of the use of arms by Saudi Arabia in Yemen. So there was some restraint there. But even there, we see that Germany uh, is a country that regularly also um, allows weapons to be supplied to countries in conflict. In particular, we can mention here the case of uh, Israel, which received submarines from uh, Germany, which have been used, for example, as missile launching platforms, and also, for example, components such as engines for the tanks that Israel uses regularly in its armed conflict. Um, so we can say that it is not new that European states supply weapons to uh, states in war. Uh, but of course, there are differences. We can also highlight when we talk uh, about uh, how this compares to the war in Ukraine. One difference I want to stress is that most of the other supplies to India, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, whatever you have, um, are often uh, seemingly more driven by economic motives, whereas, of course, the supplies to Ukraine are part of a relatively well thought through uh, security pol policy that uh, European states have uh, rapidly evolved over the past year, year aimed at containing Russia. Um, and there is that other kind of issue there. The other difference we see is that um, the, the, the strong link to the security policy in the case of Ukraine is also very outspoken. And it is not clear to which extent these other arms supplies to states in conflict and regions uh, where there are ten tensions are really a clear part of the security policies of the European states that supply arms there. So I think that's also a very clear difference there. 
And then there is the difference in that the arms supplies to Ukraine are in a way remarkably restrained. European states did step in very quickly with light arms and certain types of arms such as artillery, um, but have until now uh, refrained from sending long range missiles, refrained from sending uh, combat aircraft, and to some extent also refrained from sending advanced tanks. Even though that starts now, it's still in relatively small quantities. That has to do with logistics, it has to do with training, it has to do with the availability of arms. But of course, it also has to do with that clear security uh, assessment that there is a risk that uh, the supply of certain arms or certain quantities of arms uh, may lead to escalation. And I think that is a very important difference to stress here. And finally, the other difference to stress here is the uh, uh, transparency that European states, at least some of them, have shown in what they supply to Ukraine, um, where it is more timely and more detailed of often than what they would uh, reveal about their arms exports to other parts of the world. Thanks so much, Peter, and thanks for raising the, the conversation about what it, what is actually being restrained, um, restrained, and some of these other examples. I think it's gonna be a great fodder for a conversation. I'm gonna turn next to Sarah Lee Whitson, a democracy from the Arab world now, um, who I think will, is gonna talk a little bit about the cooperation with uh, the United States and other countries from the Middle East. So Sarah Lee, over to you in terms of what you're seeing big picture in four minutes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think I would make uh, uh, two main points, which is that the war in Ukraine has really put on warp speed uh, in the Middle East, something that was already in process uh, with the Trump administration and uh, furthered by the Biden administration, um, which is restoring arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE who are the two most lucrative clients of the United States in the whole world, uh, and very significantly forging ahead with the creation of a joint air and missile defense umbrella, including Israel, in I think is what is the most significant defense integration we've ever seen in the region. Uh, there was a flurry of activity last summer regarding the so-called Middle East Air Defense Alliance, uh, including Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, Morocco, the UAE, and the US. Uh, but the key prize uh, was Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, they would need to normalize with Israel before they would agree to be a part of a Middle East Defense uh, Alliance. And any public announcement of that defense alliance has stalled. Uh, but there was even a bill in Congress, the Defend Act bill, uh, proposed by Cory Booker, among others, uh, to demand uh, that the Biden administration move further uh, on uh, defense integration, which, of course, will also mean more U.S. arms sales to what is an integrated multi-country defense force. Uh, these talks have been taking place as part of the so-called NEGA Forum, which just recently had a second meeting, ostensibly for regional cooperation, but regional security is one of the formal working groups. Um, and it also, there are reports of a strategic framework agreement with UAE, which of course also includes a defense uh, component. Uh, we've seen integration of drone surveillance, uh, uh, drone flights already underway, as well as two regional artificial intelligence hubs in Jordan and Bahrain, uh, all under the auspices of uh, the Fifth Fleet. And last month, we saw the largest ever all-domain military exercise of Israel, including naval, land, air, space, and electronic warfare exercises as a show of presence in the region. So a massive escalation of uh, uh, military activity uh, and arms sales to the region, coupled with this integrated defense. The Ukraine war and the need to keep oil costs down and secure Middle East support for the U.S. agenda against Russia has given uh, these Middle Eastern countries, particularly Saudi and the UAE, greater leverage to intensify their demands for what they really want, which are bilateral defense agreements with the United States. The air umbrella is what the hopes the US hopes they'll be happy with, um, but what they want is more. And they are openly dangling closer military relationships with China, uh, including a weapons production facility and a nuclear uh, facility with China as a threat uh, of what they are going to do if they don't get what they want. Briefly, in terms of recommendations, uh, I think the most important thing is transparency. The Biden administration has been 
utterly opaque about what this new uh, integrated defense, uh, a mutual defense uh, agreement is uh, going to look like, already looks like. The Israelis have said that it's already in place. And where is congressional review and discussion of this? Whatever security agreements the Biden administration has committed our country to as part of this uh, integrated defense, uh, and whether there are discussions for even more dangerous bilateral agreements is something that we need to discuss publicly uh, uh, and, and, and really uh, uh, raises a lot of questions if uh, Biden administration is now proposing that we come to the defense of a state that he called a pariah. Um, Obviously, a recommendation that largely is falling on deaf ears, as what I think most people on this call would agree to, is that we really need to halt this unprecedented arms dumping in the region that is deeply, deeply destabilizing to the region and really results in no benefit to U.S. interests, none that we can see. It's clear the defense industry is benefiting handsomely from the war in Ukraine and the uh, a massive expanse of weapons to the Middle East, um, but I really don't see any benefit for U.S. national security interests, uh, far, far less for the people of the region. Thanks so much, Thirly, and um, you you did more than I expected, because you also got to the recommendations, which we'll turn to in a second. That, that's really helpful, and it's also nice um, being food for thought in terms of the different relationships in the region that are, and the the use of potential supply from China and others is always a topic we take up in you know, work in the United States. So your take on how that is being used is very interesting here as well. And hopefully we'll add to the conversation here. I'd like to turn to Nancy O'Kyle now to um, talk about what she might be seeing in terms of the countries within the region and how they are potentially exporting arms, how their arms relationship itself is, is a factor here at, at today. Thanks, Thanks Nancy. Thank you, Jeff, and it's a pleasure to be here and for the second year at CIP to co-host the annual conference with, uh, with the forum, so it's great to be here again. I mean, last year, things were looking a bit different. Uh, there were indications in terms of the level of increased level of arms, of course, by virtue of the war in Ukraine, but now we are some indication how exactly is that affecting the arms trade within the region, to the region, and from the region uh, to Russia and Ukraine and, and elsewhere. Of course, I just want to mark at the beginning that it's still too early to detect like long-term trends, uh, but we can see indication on the dynamics and how the changing nature of war and the inclusion of technology and drones and also the role of non-state actors, I mean like individual powerful uh, corporations and persons uh, has affected that. So just for a background in, in context, the US is still by far the biggest arm exporter to the Middle East. Uh, so just to give the difference, it is three times what Russia supplies in terms of arms to the Middle East and 36 times of what China supplies uh, to the Middle East. Um, again, it was just like there are other countries that are important in terms of in Europe, in terms of the supply. France is one of the biggest ones. It's um, supplying almost 80% as much of arms to, um, to uh, the Middle East as uh, compared to Russia. Uh, so it, in terms of general trends, this has not been so much different in how it was before the war in Ukraine. But the interesting part is how the war in Ukraine is affecting the dynamics in the Middle East and vice versa, and how um, the arms trade has changed. And I just wanna <clears throat> start by the most recent example, from Iran, we just learned there were some uh, news or rumors about the about Iran uh, acquiring the Su-35 fighter jets from Russia. Those uh, um, news were confirmed last week that it is indeed happening, and they are getting the Su-35, uh, which was canceled before for other countries like Egypt and Indonesia because of the um, contradiction with receiving arms from the U.S. Uh, and probably those Su-35s to Iran are uh, actually uh, those that should have been uh, exported there. Uh, 
And meanwhile, uh, it is also um, speculated that this is in return of Iran's export of drones to Russia. Again, at the beginning, there were no confirmations and evidence about that. But recently, again, there were evidence and images comparing um, the, the drones that used in the Middle East by Iran. Uh, we're talking about <laughs> the Shahid 136 uh, and uh, Mujahid is, uh, 6. Those are two uh, types of drones that were identical in the ones that were shot at Ukraine. So there was a confirmation about that. Um, now, meanwhile, while this is happening, um, Ukraine is losing a little bit of edge in that terms at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. I mean, one of the most important aspects was the export of TB2s, the, the Turkish uh, drones from Turkey to Ukraine. It gave Ukraine um, a good competitive edge, particularly at the early days of the war. However, there are two things that have affected that. First of all, Russia is imitating those drones and actually using them Meanwhile, decisions like that was made by Starlink, uh, by Elon Musk or SpaceX, to limit the use of Starlinks to the use of drones, which would limit the ability of Ukraine to use those TPGs. So Russia is getting an, uh, a greater advantage in using those, while at the same time, Turkey is, <coughs> is getting, uh, sorry, uh, Ukraine, uh, is getting less advantage and just like reports from earlier this week are saying that this might change the dynamics around like the, the advantage of um, Ukraine, um, the, Russia over Ukraine on the Black Sea. Now, there are two important things to note here. We know it's commonsensical that the war is always benefiting those who produce weapons. But it's not just in terms of volume, but there's very um, important aspects of that. First of all, the opportunity of Iran sending drones to Ukraine is giving it an advantage of actually testing those drones in real life, which gives it very important information on how to adapt and advance and refine those technologies. For example, they found out that the drones used um, in Ukraine from, from Iran, they are actually, uh, their, their noise or level of sound is high enough that people hear it before it's coming and then, which means they escape. So according to that, they are going to refine that. This is not a simple, advantage, the US in particular, have been striving to do that, to have real-time testing, for example, of for the first time last year, the US has appointed a chief technology officer to, um, to uh, the Middle East or the Central Command to try and test those drones in order to see how is that going. Uh, the other thing, of course, I mean, the use of those technologies and those drones is an opportunity uh, for marketing uh, their weapons and showing off like how they are. The second important uh, aspect of that is Israel and how the war has affected it is an opportunity and advantage and it's like going to uh, get really quickly to that. Uh, last September, uh, with the improving relationship of Israel with, the, with, with its neighbors, uh, Israel was aiming to send uh, its air defense systems and sell it to um, uh, Saudi Arabia. However, the decision of Saudi Arabia to reduce the oil prices and calls from the U.S. to stop arms to, um, uh, to Saudi Arabia has put Israel decision or, or ability at hold because the Israeli US, um, air defense system is co-funded by the US and it has a veto to stop any sales uh, from Israel. But at the same time, the increased demand uh, in Europe and decision to by 15 countries to invest in a common air defense system uh, was another opportunity for Israel. Uh, at the beginning, again, they were worried about the pushback from the US to uh, push uh, Germany, for example, to buy American drones. Now, finally, Israel has made an agreement to send 
its uh, Arrow 3 air defense system to Germany for um, a deal that was like 4 billion euros. Uh, but at the same time, this is part of a bigger deal that where the Patriots, for example, sold by uh, the US and other countries with a bigger deal of uh, 10, um, 10 million euros. Uh, just two last points about- I'm, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off here, Nancy, and maybe, <laughs> maybe give you a chance to do these in the recommendations, if right. that's all right. Sure. That's great, and I appreciate it. I mean, I think it's really helpful to think about what you're talking here at the end, that we know in every war, weapons supplied to those wars end up those would be where they're being tested uh -huh. and then they're marketed from there. It's really interesting to think about the, the Middle Eastern countries, how they are relating to the war in that way. Um, thanks so much, Nancy. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I will get back to you on the recommendations. I'd like to turn now to Michael Clare to talk a bit about um, the, sort of the, the U.S.-China relationship. And I sort of asked him to talk specifically about Taiwan, but he might take a slightly bigger picture. Those of us here in the United States certainly are very aware of the weapons that the United States is sending and the visits that are happening and this is the ratcheting up of tension. And uh, Michael, <laughs> let me turn it over to you. Very good, thank you, Jeff. And, and thanks uh, for putting this together and um, bringing the other, my co-panelists here because I'm learning a lot. But let me talk a little bit about the US in Taiwan. And this is a very peculiar case in, in my memory uh, because it, it, it's not a case of a, 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 of a supplier, I'm sorry, it's not a case of a recipient banging on the doors of the supplier begging for more arms, which is usually the case. This is a, a case where the supplier, the U.S., is trying to uh, beseech the recipient, Taiwan, to buy more weapons from the U.S., but of a particular kind, as I'll discuss, particularly uh, weapons of, of a, what they call counter-intervention weapons. But nonetheless, uh, arms sales to Taiwan has become a major political uh, objective, a, a political objective of the United States. And so it's trying to persuade the Taiwanese to get more arms. Uh, where, Taiwan is not the driving factor in the relationship. Uh, so why, what, what explains this unusual relationship? And it's because Taiwan has become the fulcrum of US efforts to contain China's rise in the Asia Pacific. The US views China now as its principal adversary and it's the principal challenge to America's continuing dominance of Asia and the Asia Pacific region, or the Indo-Pacific as they now call it, and has therefore adopted a strategy spelled out in the Indo-Pacific strategy report that the White House issued a year ago uh, to contain China's rise by building alliances in the region and on strengthening those alliances and, and enhancing their military capabilities. So this includes the Australia-US-UK Australia alliance, AUKUS, the Quad of the US-Australia and Japan, and bilateral relations with Japan and South Korea, Australia, and so on. All of these a net networks of arms related relationships designed to contain China. And Taiwan is in the middle of this. And US leaders are very determined to ensure that Taiwan never falls into the hands of China and increasingly gets intertwined in the US relationship. And, 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 and these US, uh, uh, the, these US um, alliances designed to to strangle China's growth. So this was the view before the Ukraine war broke out. And with the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, uh, this, this has only become more persistent, more powerful view in Washington. Indeed, Ukraine is viewed by American policymakers, by which I mean Congress, the White House, and the military, Ukraine is viewed as a sideshow in this grand geopolitical struggle that's now gotten underway. 
it is not viewed as the main theater of conflict, but a secondary theater of conflict in which America's principal objective is to see Russia weakened as much as possible because a weaker Russia is a weaker China. So indeed, the US is pouring uh, more money and more arms to Ukraine than it is to Taiwan. But uh, this, this should be understood as part of the larger struggle to contain China. Uh, nonetheless, at the same time, Congress is determined to accelerate the arming of Taiwan, uh, even though uh, so much of, of US weaponry is being moved towards Ukraine. Uh, and, and so uh, Congress has developed all kinds of mechanisms to, uh, to facilitate the arming of Taiwan. And this has a political dimension and a military dimension. The, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023, which was pa passed by Congress in December and signed by President Biden into law at the end of December, incorporates a separate bill called the Taiwan Enhanced Resilience Act, which uh, is specifically intended, uh, as it suggests, to enhance Taiwan's ability to resist an invasion uh, by, by China. And it, 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 in a way, it, it, it is a statement that the US is, ne is go never going to allow Taiwan to fall into Chinese hands by making it impossible for China to conquer Taiwan by military means, by beefing up Taiwan's military Capability, defensive military capabilities. So the act specifies uh, and, and uh, gives preference to what they call counter-intervention weapons, anti-ship missiles, uh, air defense weapons, and, and the like. Co the kind of weapons that have proven most effective in Ukraine. And the act provides uh, authorizes up to $10 billion over the next five years in deliveries of this kind of equipment to Taiwan. But it also includes, and this is important, uh, provides for US training of Taiwanese military forces, probably including the stationing of US forces on Taiwan. So the military part is uh, you know, based on the Ukraine experience, but the political part is in, is to gradually incorporate Taiwan into the U.S. defensive network in Asia, and this has to be seen by China as a threat to uh, to in, to interference in its internal affairs and a threat to its ability to it should it exercise its its intention to uh, seize Taiwan by force if necessary. So it makes the whole US-China relationship infinitely more stressful going forward. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Michael. And I think also those points at the end about how th there are lessons being learned in the war in Ukraine that are being applied to put the, the arms to Taiwan and the training that might happen there. I think that point um, we also do here. and. Uh, the reminder that this is another major um, place the United States is, is planning to provide weaponry uh, and what, what and might be the lessons from Ukraine there, I think were really helpful. I'm gonna now go back through the panelists one more time and ask them now for recommendations, what they think should happen next. And maybe I'll keep the same order, um, but as you are making your recommendations, feel free to pick up on what people before you have talked about, and then we'll move to Q and A. I'll just say before we do this round of um, questions around recommendations, please do feel free to use the Q&A, those people who are watching, we will circle back to that as well. Um, if you wanna actually speak your question, you can raise your hand and, and I might call on you to, to give voice to your question, but I wanna see uh, one Q&A in the moment, but I'd be happy to have others. So uh, Peter has turned on his, his video, he took the cue. So Peter, a little sense of some of the recommendations that you might have. Yeah, um, very quick. So one of the things I really want to stress, one 
more is the fact that transparency in the case of the arms exports to or the arms supplies to Ukraine has been quite significant and better often than it has been um, when it comes to arms supplies to other states. That is true, for for example, for Germany, where they release every week a list of what they have supplied and what they want supplied. And I think it's also true uh, for, for example, the United States. And I think that one of the general uh, recommendations would be to see if such transparency can also be applied elsewhere. If you can do it in the case of Ukraine, why not in the case of Saudi Arabia or in the case of India, etc. So I think that's one of the key things I wanted to say. And maybe also the other one is, and that is maybe more true for the overall kind of increase in the demand for arms in Europe, um, is that, of course, we have to keep into mind that whereas Russia has shown an intention to uh, be aggressive more than most would have expected before 2022, it has also shown to be militarily uh, much less capable than it was expected to be and also than it expected itself to be. Um, and for that matter, of course, also the military forces of Russia have depleted uh, in strength due to the war in Ukraine. And that, of course, raises then question, is it really now the point to acquire more arms or, or are, there, are there other ways to deal with that Russian threat? Is this the point in time where we have to go um, quickly buy new arms or can that wait a few years? And I think that's a very important policy uh, kind of recommendation to be made there. Great, thanks so much. I, I certainly, uh, that last point you raised, I think is one for, food for thought for many of us is, you know, I'm sitting here in the United States and the call for rapid rearming and replacement of, of uh, arsenals here as well as around the world. Um, is that a necessary step now or is there other ones? I think is a great question for us to think about. Uh, Sarah Lee, you, you threw in some recommendations. I don't know if you have more you wanna add here or I'll give you the floor. Well, since I was so efficient, I'll use the opportunity uh, uh, to add two more to the recommendations I made. Um, one is that I think it would be a grave mistake uh, to just um, uh, allow the U.S. military to make all of the decisions and strategy with respect to uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, the record of the U.S. military, uh, whether in Iraq or in Afghanistan, uh, as Secretary of Defense Miller recently pointed out and reminded us, was a complete disaster, complete failure, uh, 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 characterized by lies upon lies. Uh, and frankly, I don't think that anybody uh, who has not taken a pledge that they will never work for a defense industry lobby or foreign government lobby uh, should be allowed to make any strategic decisions, policy decisions, military decisions uh, uh, in uh, a conflict, particularly the one in Ukraine. Uh, and I would hope that the uh, people of America think carefully how long they are willing to see this war go on. Uh, last year, this time, um, when uh, some of us were ringing the alarm bells of an imminent war, people said, oh, it's not gonna happen. Then when the war started, they said, oh, it'll only take a few months. It's been a year. And my fear is that Ukraine will be Syria 2.0, uh, rubble on rubble on rubble, with no clear end in sight, no clear resolution in sight. Um, and, you know, an after uh, secondary priority for the United States, as, as Michael was just describing, uh, 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 to uh, uh, the actual so-called competition with China. Um, uh, I, I would hope that that, that, that Congress uh, uh, starts sketching out what plans it wants to see uh, for a five-year horizon or even 10-year horizon uh, with regard to Ukraine. Thanks so much, Sarah Lee. I was, I think a lot of us have the same fear of what Ukraine, you know, whether it's Syria 2.0 or many of the other countries that we've just seen turn to rubble in so many different ways, if, if that will be the future. So thanks for flagging that too. Nancy, I know I cut you off a little bit. Um, so maybe finish those thoughts and a couple of recommendations would be great. Um, yeah, I mean, the last thought I had, it was just like, and, and, and Michael knows about this more than I in terms of like the, Supply of arms to uh, to Africa and the Middle East from uh, from China, although it is not such a big volume, but it's uh, it's also indicative of the complexity of what's happening. For example, we're seeing that Algeria, which is has the <coughs> biggest uh, volume of arms. Uh, um, 
ex uh, imports in uh, in Africa, as is like a seen as part of Africa, is uh, actually turning to China uh, more. They <laughs> order to buy the uh, CH5 drones uh, from there. Again, it's not a hugely significant uh, volume or in terms of dollar terms, but it is an indication, particularly when we see that its rival Morocco, it's uh, siding with Ukraine and the US, and Morocco is now the first African country to uh, export uh, Soviet spare parts of the T-72 tanks to Ukraine. So you see what, what's happening in the war for Ukraine has an implication on the dynamics within the Middle East that is already reflective of what's happening globally, but also affecting uh, the, the conflicts within the region. In terms of recommendation, uh, one overall observation and an issue related to transparency and accountability. There is a risk to see the war in Ukraine and security assistance from the US in particular to Ukraine as representative of US security assistance around the world. Uh, and in reality, it's certainly not. It's not in terms of the level of transparency. We are proud very much or relatively seeing uh, quite transpa transparency in terms of arms or the, the amount of security assistance that are being sent to Ukraine. And we're seeing this on the news every day. Um, and second, it is also a clear objective, at least as uh, portrayed by the US, it is support for Ukraine, it's a, it's a clear cause. Uh, I mean, there are some contradictions and in, in some views of how we send and how much we send, but still, I mean, it is a clear uh, objective. And third, it's actually, uh, there's a close attention to what's happening in Ukraine and the security assistance going there. All those three factors are not the same elsewhere with security assistance to the rest of the world, which may give the perception for particularly the American public that this is a case elsewhere, which means that there is an urgent need to continue to focus on transparency uh, and accountability and monitoring and tracking US security assistance to the rest of the world, particularly at this time. Uh, the second point is related to uh, the Common Air Defense Alliance in the U.S. Uh, Dana Stroll, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, was in Riyadh on Monday, and she gave a briefing about how uh, the U.S. Uh, and GCC Working Group on Common Defense is stressing more and more on integrated approach towards both air, uh, maritime and air defense. Now, this is very important to view and observe because there are some false assumptions that the US could change its strategy towards one country in the Middle East and not the rest. Without a revision of that strategy, none of the proposition of actions towards the Middle East is actually practical. For example, I mean, the, the, the suggestions of stopping arms to Saudi Arabia after lowering the, um, the oil prices. I mean, in practice, I mean, within a framework such as that, that Dennis Stroll was talking about, this is not possible because this is part of a common integrated approach for air defense. So it is important to revisit the overall security assistance and arms to the region in light of those changing dynamics. Great, thanks so much. And thanks for picking up also on the defense systems that Sarah Leah was talking about too. So it's, it's good to have you all for that. Michael, I will give you the last shot on the set of recommendations and I'm, some great Q&A here and I might add one in that's uh, related to the Q&A, but Michael, over to you for a minute. Very good. So as I hope I pointed out earlier, arms transfers to Taiwan are, are not an arms trade issue per se, but a subset of US relations with China. Uh, and <laughs> as I tried to show uh, the aim of US arms transfers at present have a very significant political and strategic dimension, which is to try to make Taiwan as un 
to, to make it as hard as possible to, for China to conduct an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, and we have to ask whether these policies are foreclosing the possibility of peaceful, a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan situation rather than you know, focus specifically on the arms trade. We have to ask about whether US policy is making war over Taiwan increasingly likely. Bear in mind that China views these policies as interference in its internal affairs. It views Taiwan as a renegade province as part of Chinese territory. And it views uh, US arms sales to Taiwan as a violation of the pledges made by the United States when the US recognized China and uh, established diplomatic relations in 1978. Part of the basis for that establishment of relations was something called the arms trade communique, which said that the US, the US pledged in the communique to um, in its supply of arms to Taiwan that they would not increase either in quality or in numbers. And the US has certainly violated that over time. But this new round of arms transfers, I would say is even more threatening to China because it suggests ever greater US involvement directly in training Taiwanese troops and in designing uh, China, uh, Taiwan's military capabilities and in integrating US intelligence and surveillance capabilities with those of Taiwan. In fact, turning Taiwan into a, a subsidiary of the US defense network in the Pacific. So for China, the, these are unacceptable steps and could easily provoke a military confrontation with China sooner or later. So I, I, I see all of this as part of a larger trend that's pushing us ever closer to a war with China. And this could happen sooner rather than later as the latest balloon incident showed how trigger happy the US has become. And, and the, the Chinese are no less uh, trigger happy, one could say, with the, uh, with the di dispatch, the deployment of their planes and ships around Taiwan in growing numbers in recent months. So we're in a very dangerous situation. And therefore, th the recommendation has to be not to focus so much on arms trade, but to focus on the dangerous drift in US-China relations and to press for uh, increased uh, diplomacy with China uh, a, 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 and to, for President Biden to meet again with President Xi of China as soon as possible to try to overcome these uh, recent uh, rifts caused by the balloon incident and others uh, and get us back on the track of diplomacy and resolving tensions, that, that has to be the priority. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm gonna to try to do a little bit of mental jujitsu and I don't know if this is about to work, but if all the panelists could now turn on their, their videos. Um, Michael, I, was, I think was raising at the end, are there, is it now time to turn to other mechanisms besides the provision of weapons? And I think Peter also asked that question as well in his sort of final thoughts about you know, now that the war is so far along and so many weapons have been used and Russia has been shown to be not as capable as, as everyone thought, do we really need to arm up or is there another way to move forward? So I'd love for people to think about in, if they have a chance to talk about what maybe, whether there are some other things we should be talking about that would be much more important um, in, those, in the regions where you're working uh, besides the arms trade. So let me throw that out there as a, as a general question as we go. Looking through the Q&A, um, a little bit hes uh, hesitant to pick up first on the one from Calvin, because I think it might take us too, down a lot of difficult rabbit holes, but we could do it somewhat quickly. Calvin uh, Blinder is asking questions really about the Middle East, thinking about the Iranian threat to Israel and how that's affecting U.S. policy, as well as you know what should U.S. policy towards the Middle East be, especially in terms of uh, arming authoritarian Arab states. So uh, this 
could be Nancy and, and Sarah, but I think Peter and Michael might have a thought on this. Uh, how do how do we sort of make this relationship work in the Middle East, given given the arms trade side of this? Uh, but let's uh, just a couple minutes each from each of you. So I do I do recognize we're sort of ten minutes out from uh, when we were emotionally planning to end. Whoever wants to jump in first, unmute. <laughs> um, go ahead, Nancy. Sarah, go ahead. Sarah Lee. No, all right. Um, I, I, I mean, in addition to the arms trade, and I think if you want to address the arms trade, I think it will be impossible for us to succeed in uh, curbing uh, these grotesque arms sales to abusive governments, even when the candidates, the president promises to end arms sales. Every incentive in the American government and the American political system uh, is designed to reward uh, uh, an administration when they increase arms sales uh, and to punish them uh, when they decrease arms sales. So the only way I think we're going to make progress on this issue uh, is to interrupt uh, the conflicts of interest between members of the administration, members of the State Department, and the defense industry and foreign governments. And foreign governments in particular, uh, you've seen the expose in The Guardian and Haaretz yesterday, uh, 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 the expose in The Washington Post, one after the other, about foreign government infiltration, not only in our political system, but in our elections. If we don't disrupt uh, these influence machines that are corrupting our officials and undermining the credibility of their decisions and rewarding them for continued arms sales, I don't think we're going to uh, 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 merely on moral grounds or even on national interest grounds, uh, disrupt uh, uh, the, the, the arms transfers? Uh, well, I, mean, I, I totally agree with Sarah that again, to the point that it is not just about curbing the arms flows to the Middle East, which is fueling the conflict and increasing the possibility of further violence and uh, eruption of war and continuation of other wars in the Middle East, but also revisiting the frameworks of uh, security assistance and security policy towards the Middle East, again, because the US would find itself in a position that, for example, want to respond to uh, Saudi Arabia's decision to lower the oil prices, uh, but again, they won't be able to because they are tied up in commitments that is in the framework of, for example, the GCC Press 3 and Israel together. And there is an urgent need to turn to diplomacy, but not just in terms of this is uh, a point that it is better to uh, calm things down. We are seeing that the problem is the direction towards peace in the Middle East is by sending more arms. So for example, like with the Abraham Accords, I mean, the one rewarding part is sending more arms uh, to those countries. And the same thing when last summer, I mean, like there were like the revival of discussions around the GCPOA, then again, this meant sending more arms as sort of comforting the countries that are opposing and, and worried about the strength and empowerment of Iran. So the whole approach of peace so through strength or peace so that sending more arms is highly problematic and also puts the U.S. in a very difficult position of the lack of leverage or like inflexible form of leverage. Thanks so much. Uh, Peter, I think I may turn to you because you also, you know, talked about European countries sending weapons to the Middle East. So it's not, I think, only an American situation. But if I could, I also want to throw in the, the question from Spencer Ackerman here, which is asking um, what the, the impact of the Ukraine war and sort of purchasers of Russians weapons might be thinking about India. Because um, I know you also, you know, take a bit, sometimes a big picture view of what's going on in the trade. I know you can't tell us the findings for the next one, but you know, if you have a, a sense of how the arms trade might be shaking out uh, more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, let me first talk maybe about the dilemma that I have as a peace researcher, and I think many of you will share that in some ways. Is that on the one hand, I think it's extremely worrying that militarization is currently the answer to the crisis in Europe, and I think there might be other paths to take. At the same time, coming from a country which 
would have been a Nazi country if there wouldn't have been an effort by other states to support that country uh, fighting that regime. You always have to think in those historical contexts too. So I fully understand why states do supply arms to Ukraine. Um, but there are, of course, remain a whole range of quest questions there about how much that can be. But I think it's more related to what I see in Europe itself, where I believe that the extremely fast decision making processes, and we see literally that some states have decided to change laws to make that possible, lead to very fast procurement. And I'm not sure if that's the wisest thing to do now when we can see that Russia itself is not performing as expected. So I can't really see how Russia is that military threat to the extent as it is sometimes being portrayed right now. And that's why I would raise questions about whether it's maybe wiser than to invest in things like energy security or something which in Sweden is called psychological defense basically defending yourself against the things which, uh, for example, uh, uh, Sarah mentioned there to uh, the attempts by states to uh, gain influence in the political systems of Europe or of the United States. To think more about that, how you can build up a stronger psychological defense, a stronger state uh, of, of let's say the risks that are out there uh, within society uh, in your, your Europe and, 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 and create a, a system that tries to prevent that uh, uh, those, those attempts to to influence. Now that's not arms trade, so it's not really what I know that much about, I must say. So I can turn that to the other question about how how the the war in Ukraine will uh, influence global supplier recipients relationships. And for example, yes, it looks likely that the pressure on India will increase not to buy Russian equipment, the pressure from the US, but also the pressure from European states, that of course they will offer more alternative goods for that, which then leads to other risks, um, as that may uh, involve the supply of arms, which play a role in that um, uh, conflict relationship between India and Pakistan, which, as I mentioned already before, is a major issue too. And we were reminded of that by, I think, Pompeo when he mentioned uh, a month ago that he had to prevent a nuclear war between the two states. Whether that was really true or not is maybe not really, really the point here, but it does relate to how these supplier recipient um, relations may change. Um, as a result of an attempt to constrain and, and to push back Russia, but how it may create uh, the supply or how it may bring the supply suppliers into uh, potentially uh, as risky uh, situations as we have seen in Ukraine too, including the risk of nuclear war. Thanks so much, Peter. Did, Michael, did you have anything you wanted to add on this round of questions? I, I do, but but if you have more pressing questions with, with no, time, go for it. Go ahead. Well, I just want to point out that one of the lessons of Ukraine that's going to have long term consequences is a perception that uh, to fight a war like Ukraine or any major conflict like that, you, you need tons and tons and tons and millions of tons of artillery shells and anti tank uh, rockets and anti aircraft missiles, uh, and that the West has not adequately built up its capacity to manufacture these kinds of shells and missiles in quantity uh, to face a threat like that, because we're, we're, we're emptying our stockpiles, it's said, to supply Ukraine, which is burning them up every day, is emptying our stockpiles. So there's going to be tremendous pressure, certainly in the United States, and I think throughout Europe, to rebuild a uh, machine, uh, you know, assembly lines to to mass produce and stockpile artillery shells and and the like, um, and cannon and everything else. And this is going to have multi-decadal uh, impacts uh, in Europe uh, and vast investments in the many tens, hundreds of billions of dollars. So we have to be on guard about this and question whether this is a proper approach. 
Thanks so much, Michael. I think actually I might wrap it up here. There are some questions in the Q&A about where you can find budget information and about where arms might be diverted. I think it's a little bit early to talk about arms diversion from Ukraine, although it's a, it is a real concern. I think it, most of what I've been seeing around that space is that there aren't a ton diverted yet from that conflict. But I think uh, when Sarah mentions Syria 2.0, I'm thinking of Iraq 2.0 or um, you know, any country 2.0 where there's been a ton of weapons provided and then five, 10 years later, those weapons are not in that country anymore, but they're fueling conflicts nearby. I think that that could certainly be, unfortunately, the fate of Ukraine. And that's a, a fear that many of us have. I will, before I close, though, just ask if any of the panelists had anything they wanted to comment on what they heard someone else say, or if I should wrap it up here. Okay, great. I think there's a, a lot of food for thought in this. I, I took some notes in here. I think um, the question of, is this a model and the rapidity of decisions that countries are being made, uh, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, um, and the questions that you know Nancy was raising about, people are gonna see this as the, the model for the future, as an indicative of how we've been doing this, where it really isn't. Um, I heard a lot of calls for transparency, and I think that that question of, we are very transparent uh, relatively compared to other conflicts in the war in Ukraine, but will we be that transparent in future conflicts if, if we are providing weapons into those? I think all these questions are still out there and lots of good flags here. Uh, as I thank our panelists and the co-sponsors of this event, which included uh, Democracy for the Arab World Now and Center for National Policy, you, when you exit this um, event, you'll be taken to a survey. If it takes just a few seconds to do it, it gives us some input on what worked, what didn't work, how we could do better in the future. We would love to get that input. I also wanna make sure to invite you to continue joining the rest of the forum on the Arms Trade Annual Conference. We'll have two sessions in the afternoon in the United States uh, on February 21st. So you can join in in person in Washington, DC or remotely one on U.S. arms sales reform and oversight in 2023 and beyond. And another one that's very interesting, taking a look at some other topics, trade and investment in weapons, technology, and services used in repression. Let me thank all the panelists for joining in and providing their expertise. I really appreciate it. I really learned a lot and I have a, a lot to think about. I hope those who have watched this will as well. Uh, we will follow up. This video will be available and uh, about a week and a half, we'll have a report from the conference that includes recommendations and suggested resources from the panelists. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a good rest of your day.